Tests of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy Chapter 13 The event of Tess Durberfield's return from the manor of her bogus kinfolk was rumoured abroad, if rumour be not too large a word for a space of a square mile. In the afternoon several young girls of Marlott, former schoolfellows and acquaintances of Tess, called to see her, arriving dressed in their best, starched and ironed, as became visitors to a person who had made a transcendent conquest, as they supposed, and sat round the room looking at her with great curiosity. For the fact that it was this said thirty-first cousin, Mr. D'Urberville, who had fallen in love with her, a gentleman not altogether local, whose reputation as a reckless gallant and heartbreaker was beginning to spread beyond the immediate boundaries of Trantridge, lent Tess's supposed position, by its fearsomeness, a far higher fascination than it would have exercised if unhazardous. Their interest was so deep that the younger ones whispered when her back was turned, "'How pretty she is, and how that best frock do set her off! I believe it cost an immense deal, and that it was a gift from him!' Tess, who was reaching up to get the tea-things from the corner cupboard, did not hear these commentaries. If she had heard them, she might soon have set her friends right on the matter. But her mother heard, and Joan's simple vanity, having been denied the hope of a dashing marriage, fed itself as well as it could upon the sensation of a dashing flirtation. Upon the whole she felt gratified, even though such a limited and evanescent triumph should involve her daughter's reputation. It might end up in marriage yet, and in the warmth of her responsiveness to their admiration she invited her visitors to stay to tea. Their chatter, their laughter, their good-humoured innuendos, above all their flashes and flickerings of envy, revived Tess's spirits also and as the evening wore on she caught the infection of their excitement, and grew almost gay. The marble hardness left her face, she moved with something of her old bounding step, and flushed in all her young beauty. At moments, in spite of thought, she would reply to their inquiries with a manner of superiority, as if recognising that her experiences in the field of courtship had, indeed, been slightly enviable. But so far was she from being, in the words of Robert South, in love with her own ruin, that the illusion was transient as lightning. Cold reason came back to mock her spasmodic weakness. The ghastliness of her momentary pride would convict her, and recall her to reserved listlessness again, and the despondency of the next morning's dawn, when it was no longer Sunday, but Monday, and no best clothes, and the laughing visitors were gone, and she awoke alone in her old bed, the innocent younger children breathing softly around her. In place of the excitement of her return, and the interest it had inspired, she saw before her a long and stony highway, which she had to tread without aid, and with little sympathy. Her depression was then terrible and she could have hidden herself in a tomb. In the course of a few weeks Tess revived sufficiently to show herself so far as was necessary to get to church one Sunday morning. She liked to hear the chanting, such as it was, and the old psalms, and to join in the morning hymn. That innate love of melody, which she had inherited from her ballad-singing mother, gave the simplest music a power over her, which could well-nigh drag her heart out of her bosom at times. To be as much out of observation as possible for reasons of her own, and to escape the gallantries of the young men, she set out before the chiming began, and took a back seat under the gallery, close to the lumber, where only old men and women came, and where the beer stood on end among the churchyard tools. Parishioners dropped in by twos and threes, deposited themselves in rows before her, rested three-quarters of a minute on their foreheads, as if they were praying, though they were not, then sat up and looked around. When the chants came on, one of her favourites happened to be chosen among the rest, the double chant, Langdon. 
but she did not know what it was called, though she would have much liked to know. She thought, without exactly wording the thought, how strange and godlike was a composer's power, who, from the grave, could lead through the sequences of emotion, which he alone had felt at first, a girl like her who had never heard of his name, and never would have a clue to his personality. The people who had turned their heads turned them again as the service proceeded, and at last, observing her, they whispered to each other. She knew what their whispers were about, grew sick at heart, and felt that she could come to church no more. The bedroom which she had shared with some of the children formed her retreat more continually than ever. Here, under her few square yards of thatch, she watched winds and snows and rains, gorgeous sunsets, and successive moons at their full. So close kept she that at length almost everybody thought she had gone away. The only exercise that Tess took at this time was after dark. It was then, when out in the woods, that she seemed least solitary. She knew how to hit to a hair's breadth that moment of evening when the light and the darkness are so evenly balanced that the constraint of day and the suspense of night neutralize each other, leaving absolute mental liberty. It is then that the plight of being alive becomes attenuated to its least possible dimensions. She had no fear of the shadows. Her sole idea seemed to be to shun mankind, or rather that cold accretion called the world, which, so terrible in the mass, is so unformidable, even pitiable, in its units. On these lonely hills and dales her quiescent glide was of a piece with the element she moved in. Her flexuous and stealthy figure became an integral part of the scene. At times her whimsical fancy would intensify natural processes around her, till they seemed a part of her own story. Rather, they became a part of it. For the world is only a psychological phenomenon, and what they seemed, they were. The midnight airs and gusts, moaning amongst the tightly wrapped buds and bark of the winter twigs, were formulae of bitter reproach. A wet day was the expression of irremediable grief at her weakness in the mind of some vague ethical being whom she could not class definitely as the god of her childhood, and could not comprehend as any other. But this encompassment of her own characterization, based on shreds of convention, peopled by phantoms and voices apathetic to her, was a sorry and mistaken creation of Tess's fancy, a cloud of moral hobgoblins by which she was terrified without reason. It was they that were out of harmony with the actual world, not she. Walking among the sleeping birds in the hedges, watching the skipping rabbits on a moonlit warren, or standing under a pheasant-laden bough, she looked upon herself as a figure of guilt intruding into the haunts of innocence. But all the while she was making a distinction where there was no difference. Feeling herself in antagonism, she was quite in accord. She had been made to break an accepted social law, but no law known to the environment in which she fancied herself such an anomaly. End of chapter 13